All right, we'll continue our, our journey here through John chapter 6 um, with the feeding of the 5,000, all right? So we discussed that a little bit uh, briefly last week. Um, before we get into it, though, I want to spend just a, a moment here in prayer, and then uh, we'll get started. Father, first of all, Lord, just thank you so much again um, that we have the privilege to spend some time in your presence, to open up the love letter that you've written to us in the Gospel of John, God, and read it for ourselves, read it uh, with our own two eyes. And Lord, I just pray and I ask in advance, Lord, that you might um, just come by the power of your Holy Spirit and grant us, God, hearts that are open to your word. And Lord, at the same time, God, would you just open your word uh, to our hearts. God, I pray that we would hear you in a really clear way today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So here in the feeding of the 5,000, it's this unique miracle that takes place again in the Gospels. It's the only miracle outside of the resurrection of Jesus Christ that is recorded in all four Gospels, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and in John. But in John, we find it here in the beginning of John chapter 6, verses 1 through 14. And uh, this morning, what I would like to do is just read again where we covered uh, last week, verses 1 through 7. This is what it says. After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And then a great multitude followed him because they saw his signs, which he performed on those who were diseased. And Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. Now, the Passover... A feast of the Jews was near. Then Jesus lifted up his eyes, and seeing a great multitude coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread that these may eat? But this he said to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. And Philip answered him and said, Two hundred denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them might have a little." Now, in this particular uh, miracle, I want to spend some time expanding on what we looked at last week, and that's how, how will we respond, how do we respond when God tests our faith? Uh, because God does test our faith, and when our faith is tested, where, where are we going to turn for deliverance in that process? Now, in that story, we found out uh, just a few brief things that I wanted to cover in summary from last week. First of all, it happened in the town of Bethsaida, or nearby the town of Bethsaida, which you can see there uh, at the northern edge of the Sea of Galilee. We also know that um, in, in John's Gospel, John takes the time to highlight what's going on in Philip the uh, disciple's life more than any of the other writers. Matthew, Mark, and Luke only mention his name as one of the twelve disciples, and that's it. But in the Gospel of John, we find out that Philip, uh, in chapter 1, he recruits Nathaniel. Chapter 6 here, he's... Uh, interacting with Jesus regarding the feeding of the 5,000. In chapter 12, uh, Greek Gentiles ask Philip for access to Jesus. And then in chapter 14, um, right after Jesus has said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. Philip asks Jesus and he says, hey, show us the Father and it's enough for us. Right? After hanging out with Jesus uh, all that time, which is a great example again of how we tend to respond. Now, Jesus asks Philip, here in chapter 6, where are we going to get bread to feed these people? And again, why does he ask Philip? He asks Philip because Philip is from the town. This is his hometown, Bethsaida. These are the ruins of Bethsaida. They're on the north side of the Sea of Galilee. And this was where Philip was from. And so Jesus logically asked him and he says, hey, where are we going to get this food? Now, John clearly says Jesus doesn't ask Philip for no reason. He's asking Philip to test him. And we were reminded that the Lord... The Lord will test us. He will test our faith. He is going to um, test what we believe and how, how we're going to respond to what we believe. Now, in the test, Philip's immediate response is with what? He's, he goes straight to money. He says, hey, 200 denarii, the currency of the day in the Roman Empire, that's not enough. We can't even feed these people with 200 denarii's worth of bread. And we discussed how um, why is it that we always so quickly turn to money thinking that money is going to solve all of our problems when it doesn't? 
Um, rich people have just as many problems as poor people do. In fact, you might even say they might have more. Okay, so Jesus himself said regarding money, right, no one can serve two masters. Either he'll love the one and hate the other or be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and what? You can't serve both God and money. Also, we discussed briefly this idea of 200. Uh, what's the significance of the word um, 200 in Scripture? It specifically speaks of insufficiency and things being insufficient. And then as we closed out um, last week, we highlighted the idea that we need to be seeking the Lord's plan in our lives instead of our own. Now, with that being said, let's continue here and see how Andrew is going to respond. Uh, Philip... Uh, the disciple, he responds with money. Let's see what Andrew does. We'll pick it up in verse 8. And one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? Now, it's another interesting little circumstance in John's gospel. John here clearly has already referenced Philip. Now he references Andrew, who happens to be Simon Peter's brother, right? Why does he bring up these uh, folks in the story? Well, they're all from the same hometown. Uh, scripture also tells us that Andrew and Peter, Bethsaida, is their um, hometown. And next, we also find out uh, regarding Andrew, that Andrew does something really unique in the gospel of John. And the way John writes about Andrew is really unique. Every time he writes about Andrew in the Gospel of John, uh, Andrew is living out his God-given gift. And Andrew's God-given gift is he likes to bring people to Jesus. Every single time Andrew is mentioned in Scripture, he's bringing somebody to Christ. In John chapter 1, he brings his brother Peter to Jesus. In John chapter 6, he's bringing this boy to Jesus. In John chapter 12, uh, Andrew is going to bring Greek Gentiles to Jesus. And so every single time Andrew is mentioned, he's always bringing other people to Christ. And I got to thinking about for us, wouldn't that be nice if we were known for the same thing? That'd be a great reputation to have. Are you known as somebody that brings other people to Jesus, points other people to Jesus? I was thinking about it in regards to insufficiency, okay? Who could you invite to come to church with you next week? Not that they need to be here at this church, but who could you invite to come with you to church or come with you to Bible study or uh, so that you could visit with them about Christ? You know, a, a simple invitation might not seem like much. And it's really not very much. It's insufficient. It's just a simple invitation. But can God accomplish miracles with what seems insignificant? Well, that's what we're going to see here in this miracle, right? Next, <clears throat> we encounter something else here in this miracle that's interesting. And it's the timeline of the day uh, when this miracle takes place. What time of day does this miracle take place? What time? In the evening. It's dinner time. Okay. So this evening takes place uh, toward the end of the day. Lunch already came and went, okay? Whatever food the 5,000 <clears throat> brought with them for the day has already been consumed hours ago. Needless to say, um, the crowd hadn't planned in advance to stay so long, let alone prep for dinner. Also, if Jesus dismissed the crowd at this point, I got to thinking about it, had Jesus said, okay, bag it, we got to get these people out of here so that they've got a chance to get home, get something to eat, whatever. If he dismissed the crowd at that point, can you imagine the dinner rush in Bethsaida? This small fishing village, right? There's no way. I mean, if you dismiss these 5,000 men, let alone women and children, that, that, that would be a major dinner rush, right? It's just not even possible. So... The Bible says that Andrew brought a boy to Jesus. Now, I'd like to refer uh, for a moment. I used to like to refer to this boy, and I still do. Uh, I like that he has a sack lunch. That's basically what he has. And it may have actually been a sack lunch. We don't know uh, for sure. But he certainly hadn't finished eating it yet. He certainly had some left over. But lunch was gone, right? I also imagine people forgetting to bring a lunch. 
right? In the past, when I've read this story, it's like, why are everybody's out there without a lunch? That's not the issue. Lunch is already gone. They probably did bring lunch with them, and they ate it hours ago, right? Now they've got nothing, okay? Also, <clears throat> regarding this boy, uh, do you think the boy packed his own lunch? No. Who probably packed his lunch for him? His mom, right? That's the way it works. His mother probably packed it for him. Maybe she gave him food for a whole day of play. We don't know. Maybe she packed him, hey, there's enough in here for lunch and for dinner. You have to kind of ration it, son. Or maybe like all boys, he just lost track of time while playing or listening to Jesus. Or maybe he'd already eaten his lunch-sized portion of his meal there. But regardless, he had some left. Now, another thing that I think is interesting regarding this boy, he's just a kid. He's just a kid. The term in Greek means a child or a young boy. All the other adults around him came what? Unprepared. Right? But this boy has got something to eat. Now, it's interesting. I asked uh, somebody to read Matthew chapter 19, verse 14, please. All right, let the children come to me, said Jesus. Don't hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. And here in this particular example, you've got this enormous crowd of adults. None of the adults have anything. They're completely unprepared. And at this point, this child is the example. Okay, uh, I asked somebody for Matthew 18, verses 2 through 3. Unless you become as a little child, you'll never even enter the kingdom of heaven. So there's something really significant about being a child. And here we see this child involved. Now, the crowd of adults that are there for this miracle, they're about to have a direct encounter with the kingdom of God come to earth. Okay, they're going to get a glimpse of the kingdom of God coming to earth. And who leads them? A little child. It's a partial fulfillment of Isaiah's messianic prophecy found in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 6. I asked somebody for that. Who had that one? Isaiah 11, 6. All right, great. Thanks, Isaac. And a little child shall what? A little child's going to lead them. What do we see happening right here uh, with Jesus as the kingdom of God is coming down to earth in this particular moment? There's a little child and he's leading them. Also, they were about to receive a direct answer uh, to the prayer that Jesus taught them to pray in Matthew chapter 6. What we call the Lord's Prayer starts out, <clears throat> uh, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom what? Come, thy will be done on where? earth as it is in heaven right so they're going to catch this really cool glimpse here in just a moment where uh, heaven and earth are going to connect okay now how many uh fish and how many loaves of bread does he have how many loaves of bread five now these are not wonder uh, wonder bread loaves of bread pre-sliced and pre-bagged okay these are more like wheat thins than they are a loaf of bread okay um also he's got how many fish He's got two, right? So what's the significance of these two numbers? Again, we learned uh, in chapter 5 that the number 5 in the Bible is a clear reference to the issue of grace, okay? The need for grace. Uh, the number 2 in Scripture um, is often associated with three things, either union, division, or witnesses. Now, we see all of these meanings right here in this miracle, did the people deserve dinner? Did they deserve it? No, they came completely unprepared. Without grace, they're going to suffer the resulting hunger. Unless somebody's gracious, they're going to they're going to suffer the result of their poor planning. Also, regarding union, in a moment the crowd is going to catch a glimpse of heaven 
and earth united. Regarding division, uh, later on in this chapter, all the followers of Jesus Christ, there is going to be a massive division as a result of this miracle and Jesus' subsequent teaching on it. The crowd that's following Jesus is going to say, have a nice one, we're out. There's going to be division. And when they are ultimately divided, what are they going to end up rejecting? Two witnesses, Jesus' miracles and Jesus' teaching. Okay, so we've got five, five uh, loaves of bread and, and two fish. Now, what's the significance of barley bread? John is the only one who mentions what kind of bread it is. And he says that it's barley bread. Well, the, the description of barley um, is important. First of all, barley was only for poor people. The wealthy in Jesus' day ate wheat bread or bread from better grains. The boy probably came from a home of poverty uh, and meager, meager means. However, I got to thinking about it. I imagine his entire family felt pretty well off, pretty wealthy, when that boy burst through the door later that evening and told his mom, Mom, you'll never guess what happened with my sack lunch. <laughs> And so much of the time in Scripture, man, when we see how God is at work and things that God is doing, He's pursuing, he's pursuing the poor. He's pursuing the needy. He's pursuing people uh, that are destitute. And praise God that He does, because the truth is, whether we have money in the bank or whether we don't, spiritually speaking, are we not all poor, destitute, needy? Second, it's a reference again, this idea of barley, uh, to the time of year. Uh, barley harvest happened uh, right at Passover time, which John mentions. That's when this miracle takes place. It's the season of barley harvest. Where else do we find barley harvest highlighted a ton in Scripture? Uh, it's in one of the main books. Uh, one of the main books that you find in the Bible is the book of Ruth. In Ruth, we find our heroine working in bar barley fields belonging to Boaz, right? And Boaz is her kinsman redeemer, her redeemer. And the fields are located just outside of the city of Bethlehem. The name Bethlehem means house of bread. And I was thinking about it in this miracle. Again, here, John, we discover future Israel. Okay? Future Israel at that time, the bride of Christ, and they're hanging out with who? In that moment. They don't realize it, but who are they hanging out with? Their Redeemer, their kinsman Redeemer. And what is Jesus? He's going to tell them what he is. He's going to say he's the bread of what? He's the bread of life. He's the house of bread. Now, regarding the fish, um, I think it's important for us to think about that these fish are not uh, the sort of fish that you would want to highlight in a normal fish story. Like, my fish was this big, right? This story is more like, my fish were only this big. I only had these two little tiny fish. They're more sardines than salmon, okay, if you look it up. These are not huge fish, okay? Finally, I think it's interesting regarding Andrew, and you relate him to Philip for just a second. Andrew struggled to have faith just like Philip did. Philip looked for a financial solution. He went straight to money. And Andrew looked at what physical food they actually possessed. But both of them, they, neither one of them necessarily looks to Christ so much. It's like Philip's like, oh, what kind of money do we got? We don't got enough money. And Andrew's like, oh, we just got this boy sack lunch. That's it. I, we've looked. There's nothing else, Jesus. We just, here. Here's the lunch pail. However, I was thinking one thing about Andrew that I love, and it's something that we should seek to follow and emulate. Jesus is not asking you um, to do the miraculous. He's the God of miracles. All Jesus is asking is that we would just bring him what we have. It doesn't matter how meager or insufficient it is. He just wants us to give him what we have. Come with what you have. And then God promises he'll take what we offer no matter how meager it is, and he'll turn around and bless it and do the miraculous with it. And that's exactly what we see happen. 
later on in this miracle. And I got to thinking for a practical example of somebody just being willing to bring um, what little they had and offer it to Jesus. Um, Arlene Tatum is a missionary that we support here at the church, and, and she comes normally about once a year uh, to give an update on um, the missionary work that she does in Africa. And if you know Arlene, I mean, she's, let's just be straight up. I mean, she's got many years on her. And when God called her to start doing this, she's a single woman. She's got serious health conditions. And she feels like God is calling her uh, to go to Africa and share the message of Jesus Christ in Africa, in war-torn places and parts of Africa where people are at each other's throats, wanting to kill each other, going into prisons, all that sort of stuff. A single elderly woman with serious health problems and God called her to go do that. And what has God done with that meager offering? Holy smokes. I mean, hundreds and hundreds. It's probably now in the thousands of people have come to know Christ as a result of God at work through Arlene Tatum. That's an enormous amount of glory that's supposed to go, that should go, and she gives it to God because that's where it should go. But God is just inviting us to say, listen, would you just, I know you think, oh, I got nothing. And God is saying, listen, just give me what you have. And watch what I'll do with it. Verse 10. Jesus said, remember Andrew said, we've got the sack lunch, Jesus. Then Jesus' response is, have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in that place, so the men sat down, about 5,000 in number. Now, first of all, we know for sure uh, that this crowd is at least 5,000. However, according to Matthew, we know for sure it's way more than 5,000 because Matthew says it also included women and children. So some scholars estimate that this crowd that Jesus feeds at this point is somewhere in the neighborhood of 15 to possibly 20,000 people. Now, when we go over sometimes to Medford and we'll go to the outdoor uh, concerts there, and I think it's still called the Lithia Outdoor Auditorium, whatever thing they have over there by the fairgrounds. We've been to concerts over there and there'll be 10,000 people. And you look all over the place and you see 10,000 people. And I'm telling you, this crowd that Jesus is looking at and the disciples are looking at is more than, go to yourself a nice really big concert, more than that crazy. It is a big crowd. Imagine how massive the crowd would have seemed to the disciples 2,000 years ago while they're standing outside a small coastal fishing village on the north side of the Sea of Galilee. I mean, we're talking big. Next, Jesus commanded the disciples to be obedient to the sound of his voice. He tells them to do something and they obeyed what he said. And they did it. They went through the crowd. They asked the people to sit down. Other gospels clarify that they had the people sit in groups of 50. And I was thinking about it for us. Listen, if you and I want to begin encountering a God at work in our life in miraculous ways, then we need to simply believe Jesus, take Jesus at what he said, and do it. So much of the time, we miss out on a ton of things that I believe God would love to be able to do in and through our lives because we'll maybe hear what Jesus says, but we're like, I'm not doing that. That's risky. That's out of my comfort zone. And God forbid I be outside my comfort zone. Here in this case, Jesus says, hey, do this. The disciples, to their credit in this moment, they obey and they do it. I was also thinking, it's evening. It's springtime. I got to thinking, man, can you imagine a bright green hillside overlooking the Sea of Galilee on the northern shore? Probably the sun was sinking low over the hills. Verse 11. Jesus then, he took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish, as much as they wanted. Now, Jesus took what they offered, and he did what with it? He blessed it. He, he took what they offered, and he blessed it. 
abundantly so. And I was thinking about what Scripture has to say about this. If you want to flip there, I would encourage you. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 through 8. You can hold your finger there in John chapter 6. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 8. Speaking about giving things to God and seeing what God will do with them, Paul wrote it this way. The point is this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully, meaning a lot, will also reap bountifully. Each one of you must give as he's decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver, and God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. Man, do we not see that going on right here in this miracle? They give Jesus what they have, this boy's sack lunch. Jesus takes it and he does the miraculous with it. And it's abounding, this miracle is. Okay? Now, I asked somebody to read Luke chapter 6, verse 38. Who has that one? All right, great. Thanks, Paige. Give, and what's God promised to do? This is from Jesus himself. What does God promise to do? Give, and what? What will he do? We just read it. What will he do? What will he do? Oh, he'll give it back. How much will he give back? An enormous amount, so much that it's running over all over the place, right? It's pressed down, it's shaking together, it's running over, okay? Give, it'll be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, it'll be poured into your lap, for with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. So, when we're nervous about getting outside of our comfort zone and giving God what little we have, what's God's promise? It'll fill, it'll fill our cup up and it'll run over. That's right. He'll fill it up and it'll run over. Now, that doesn't mean if I give God, you know, like, okay, God, I'm going to give you my, my 20 bucks. Now, let me sit around and wait for you to just give me 20,000 bucks. No, that's not, that's not what he's speaking about. How God uses and turns around and gives back to us sometimes looks different than the way we initially give. But regardless, God promises to abundantly bless us. And we find both of these verses we just looked at on display in, in great glory here with the 5,000 fed. The disciples surrendered all they had, and God turned around and he gave them so much in return that it literally spilled out all over the place. And everyone received how much? How much does it say? As much as they wanted. As much as they wanted. It was a good measure. It was pressed down. It was shaken together. It was running over. Listen, if you want to fill a container, how do you fill that container clear full? If it's loose objects, how do you do that? You pour the stuff in a little at a time and you do what? You press it down, shake it, fill all the voids, keep pouring in, keep pouring in, shake it, press it down. And eventually the vessel reaches what? Capacity. Uh, we just uh, put this into practice over the last couple years with um, Isaac and Haley. Um, Danielle had a hot idea for their graduation. Um, to show them the value of a penny, <laughs> to uh, gather up pennies and take a five, five gallon water jug, which we did for both of them, right? And fill it clear full with pennies and five gallon water jug. And she was really intentional about pouring it in, shaking it really good. I mean, she, we packed it clear full. It was heavy, right? It was heavy. Yeah. But if you're going to pack a container, that's what you have to do. And God is saying, listen, hey, if you'll give me what you have, I'll take it and I'll do the miraculous with it. I don't care how meager you think it is. I'll do the miraculous with it. Now, if I'm honest and I'm living with a proper perspective, I mean, I have to admit that the Lord has done this, proved this verse over and over and over and over again in my life. 
for all the times that I've been like Israel and I've complained over things that haven't worked out like I wanted or when I wanted, my life has been enormously blessed. And if you're honest, so has yours. Have we all gotten everything that we wanted? No. But has God been crazy good to you? Yeah, He has been. I know that for me, I tell Danielle this often, but I just feel like with Danielle, when I married Danielle, I just feel like I won the jackpot. And I still feel like every day, like a boy just going up to a slot machine, and it's still just ding, 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 ding. Did I deserve that? No, I didn't deserve that. But we think sometimes like, oh, God doesn't see me. Oh, he doesn't, he doesn't see my needs. Baloney, he does. Also, Jesus, before he starts passing this stuff out, what does he pause to do? To give thanks. <clears throat> Just for a point of personal conviction, and hopefully some conviction for you too. Um, how often, before you sit down and you eat your meal, do you pause and give thanks? Great if it's all the time. I know sometimes for me, I get lazy about it. Other times I'm really good about it. But regardless, man, we, we ought to pause. We ought to be grateful. Man, while we're sitting down today, hopefully uh, after, after we're done here, we'll go get some lunch. Going to sit down, we'll have a meal, and we'll get to do something that millions of people all over the face of the earth don't have the opportunity to do. Jesus takes this, he gives thanks. And then in Matthew's account, we learn an interesting detail. Jesus, after blessing the bread, he breaks it, and then he does something really interesting with it. Jesus takes the bread and the fish, and he begins to break it. And then Matthew tells us, Jesus hands it to the disciples. And then the disciples take it from Jesus, and then they start passing it out. And that's another beautiful demonstration. Listen, you can't give what you don't have. You can't give what you don't have. As I spend time with Jesus, personally speaking for me, when I spend time with Him, I have never, I have never, not one time in my life, taken the time to sit down and spend some time with Jesus. Jesus, and then walked away and thought to myself, now that was a waste of time. What really happens is it's the exact opposite. I, I roll up, I spend time in his presence. I'm just a broken, sinful man. I got no, no special qualities or anything else other than I'm just created in God's image and he loves me and he wants to spend time with me. You're created in God's image. He loves you. He wants to spend time with you. When you roll up, he's happy that you're there. God pours into our lives. And as we receive from the Lord, just like the disciples did, Jesus broke, he gave it to the disciples. As you receive from the Lord, what does God then want you to turn around and do? This is not hard. What does he want you to turn around and do? Give it away. I'll tell you another thing regarding this give. It'll be given to you, pressed down, shaking together, running over. We talked about it a little bit in Sunday school today uh, in the life of Stephen. Man, when you spend time in God's presence, it just sort of flows out. It just sort of overflows anyway. It's just a natural occurrence. Now, here at the end of verse 11 and the beginning of verse 12, John reemphasizes just how satisfied the people were. How satisfied were the people? Thanksgiving stuffed. Thanksgiving stuffed. That's how satisfied they were. By the time Jesus turned off the supernatural spigot and said, okay, that's enough, everybody 
has received as much as they wanted, or as verse uh, 12 tells us, John 6, verse 12, and when they had eaten their fill, when they'd eaten their, uh, till they were full, he told his disciples, gather up the leftover fragments that nothing may be lost. Now the word here in Greek for fill means to fill up, to fill full, to take one's fill of, and to glut one's desire. I mean just completely stuffed. I was thinking, by the time Jesus finished, the physical hunger of this multitude, again, picture a huge crowd at a concert. I mean, that's what you're talking about. <clears throat> the physical hunger of this multitude was completely satisfied. So when the disciples passed by the groups of 50 seated on the green grass, they were probably eventually greeted by a raised hand saying, hey, no more, please. I couldn't possibly eat another bite. Been that full before? Man, I, I love being that full. <laughs> That's great, especially if it's a holiday time, right? It reminds me again of Thanksgiving, right? You ever finish with a Thanksgiving meal and your belly is just like wicked tight? And you're like, wow, I ate too much, right? I ate too much. They were probably beginning, you can picture them there on the grass. They're maybe beginning to sprawl out, to recline in the evening sun. Maybe they were even in beginning to enjoy a sunset, which I was thinking about. Imagine if they were there. We know it's evening time, so maybe the sun is beginning to set. And they're enjoying a sunset, possibly, that's painted for them by the Son of God who's standing in their midst. Wild. It's wild. But there's a problem. Jesus only satisfied their what? Their physical hunger. Their physical hunger is satisfied, but it's only temporary, right? You eat Thanksgiving and you say to yourself, oh, I'm so full, I couldn't possibly eat another bite. And then evening rolls around and you're doing what? Yeah, you're looking for a piece of pie, right? You're looking for leftovers, right? Because that sensation, that physical sensation is now gone. Physical food does not provide lasting satisfaction. And though they were physically stuffed, the crowd remained spiritually starved. The food only penetrated their stomachs. It never touched their soul. Um, the Rolling Stones, right? They made their song like super famous, right? I can't get no what? I can't get no satisfaction. In this world, that's true. Right on, Rolling Stones. That's the truth. I can't get no satisfaction. This world offers none. None that lasts. None that, none that endures. Only Jesus provides lasting spiritual satisfaction. Then Jesus told the disciples to go and he said, Hey, I want you to go out there and I'd like you to gather the cherry on the top of this miracle. While Jesus, think about it. While Jesus was producing food out of thin air, he was aware of exactly how much was needed. And when Jesus reached the place where he knew everybody was Thanksgiving stuffed and the disciples were, were still starving, Jesus said, okay, let's just keep this going until we have enough for how many baskets left over. And then Jesus went. And he shut the switch off. And then he tells the disciples, hey, go gather up the leftovers. In Mark, we learn uh, the practical importance of it. In Mark chapter 6, verse 31, it says regarding this miracle, the disciples had been so busy heading into this miracle that they hadn't even had time to what? Eat. Okay? The, the disciples needed food. They needed rest. That was the original purpose for Jesus pulling them away by boat to a hillside. It was for both. But when they arrived on the shore, they had time for neither because there's a crowd awaiting them. I'm sure the disciples were starved by this point. Even though they were certainly dumbfounded by what they had just witnessed while they served the multitude, the reality of an empty stomach, I'm sure, loomed large, especially uh, when the adrenaline of the moment began to wear off. And then Jesus revealed to them that their needs were also seen by their Savior. Every single person at this miracle would leave stuffed including the disciples. And sometimes when we feel like, oh, God doesn't see me. 
Well, he sees those people, but he doesn't see me. First of all, you just need to understand that that's a lie from Satan. That's not true. God sees you. He sees us. Verse 13. So they gathered them up and filled twelve baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. Now, I find it interesting. Okay? They've gone out and they've gathered up these fragments. Now, the disciples are sitting down having something to eat too. And I was just thinking, this is just... Scripture has, does not elaborate on this. This is just, I'm just encouraging you to use your imagination. But can you imagine what wondrous thoughts ran through the minds of the disciples as they sat on green grass and feasted on an entire basket of leftovers? A miracle that Jesus allowed them to participate in? Where else in Scripture do we find the Lord asking us to lie down in green pastures and sit beside still waters. I asked somebody for Psalm 23, verses 1 through 2. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. I don't know. We know that it's not storming at this point. There's a storm that comes up immediately following this. But at the moment, as they're reclining there in the green grass, maybe the sun's setting over the western hills, They're overlooking the Sea of Galilee. I wonder, was the water still? Was it like a glass glass reflection of a glorious evening? I'll show you a picture from our last trip to Israel. This is in the morning. This is not the evening. Um, But this is the sun coming up over the Golan Heights, over the Sea of Galilee. And it got me thinking about, like, I wonder, I wonder if... They're sitting there on the green grass. All these people are completely satisfied. They're now satisfied. They've had this food. Are they just looking down on a a glassy sea like that? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. Listen to what Ephesians chapter 3, verse 2 through 21 says. To him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think or imagine, some versions say, according to the power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen, it says. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all that we can ask or imagine. Is that not what happens in this miracle? Jesus asked them, Philip, give them something to eat. Philip's imagination goes, I got 200 bucks. Andrew's imagination goes, well, we got a sack lunch. And Jesus says, okay, watch, I'll do something beyond anything you can ask or imagine. To him, to Jesus, not to us, We roll up with our insufficiency, but to Him be the glory for now and forever. Amen. And that's what you see portrayed right here in this miracle. And it got me, again, thinking regarding the question we were thinking about before. Listen, if we'll trust Him, if we'll trust Him in the test, we'll witness miracles. I've seen God do it in my life over and over and over again. When the Lord comes on me by the power of His Spirit and actually enables me to trust Him instead of doubt Him, and I turn around and I see God do stuff like, what in the world? It's miraculous. Will we trust Him in the test? Verse 14. When the people saw the sign that Jesus had done, they said, this is indeed the prophet who's come into the world. Now, they're referencing here uh, a prophecy that Moses spoke all the way back in the book of Deuteronomy. You can look it up if you want, but it's Deuteronomy 18.15. And it's evidenced 
here again of how well the people knew God's word, but not the meaning of God's word. Okay? This is what the prophecy says. Moses prophesied and said, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. That's what they're referencing, this idea of, uh, is this indeed the prophet who's come into the world? That's this prophecy that they're referencing. And the people have <clears throat> began to believe Jesus was at least from God or sent by God. However, they failed to grasp that he was God in their midst. And it's understandable. Who, who here would, I mean, we'd all struggle with that. They're wrestling to grasp that it's God in their midst. And can you imagine if they were able to grasp it for just a moment, which they didn't, but can you imagine if they were, they'd be sitting there on the grass thinking, Almighty God just served me dinner. But they don't see that. They miss the true identity of Jesus. Do we reflect on how incredible it is that, not only, uh, that we not only have the opportunity to feast on God's word, but by faith, the Bible says that God Almighty has made his home where? Within me, in my heart. There's a great uh, song out there by Jeremy Camp. Um, speaking about this verse in Romans chapter 8, verses 11. And it says this, The Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead. This is a fact, okay? This is a fact for believers. He said, The Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. Whoa. He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give to your life, to your mortal bodies, through His Spirit who dwells in you. You, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, lives where? That's intense. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in me. If you're here as a follower of Christ, it lives in you. I want to pause right now and just ask you to close your eyes as we close. I want you to, as we close out today, just reflect on two thoughts. First thought I want you to reflect on is why are you interested in Jesus? Do you actually want Jesus or do you just want what he can do? Why are you interested in Jesus? Do you want Him or just what He can do? Last one. Think about this. The same power that fed the 5,000 lives within you. You have access to the abundant, inexhaustible power of God to face every test that He sends your way. Father, somehow, some way, by the power of Your Spirit, it's a great example of the fulfillment in some respects of you saying, give, it'll be given to you. Good measure, pressed down. Uh, you're able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all we can ask or imagine. What's something that's beyond anything I can ask or imagine? To realize that somehow the power of God, Almighty God, same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives within me. If that isn't exceedingly abundantly beyond all I can ask or imagine, I don't know what is. Lord, I just ask and I pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you just help us to begin to believe what you've said. 
and to apply it, Lord God, to our lives, to apply it, uh, Lord, in the lives of other people that we know, other people that we interact with, God. Lord, that our lives would be like the disciples in that moment of the feeding of the 5,000, God, where we'd be faithful to come to you consistently over and over again and receive from you. But Lord, that we wouldn't just receive only, but God, then we'd turn around and give it away and give it away and give it away and come back for more and give it away and come back for more and give it away. And allow you, the God of the miraculous, to pour into us and out through us, God, into a world that is lost and in need. And God, in the midst of it all, when you come and you test us, and we go through seasons of testing, which we will endure, God, I pray that by your grace and your mercy, God, help us trust you. It's in your name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. As we close this morning, I'd like for you to stand, if you would, and we're going to sing a song, and then we'll dismiss. I just want to sing uh, Jesus' name above all names this morning as we close, all right? So if you could stand, and we'll just sing it acapoco, okay? Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There's just something about that name. Master, Savior, Jesus, like the fragrance after the rain. Jesus, 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 let all heaven and earth proclaim. Kings and kingdoms will all pass away. But there's something about that name. May the Lord bless you. Thanks for your time. You're dismissed.